afternoon, this is the final round of original oratory. Once the round has begun, you will be allowed to leave only between speakers. There are to be no photographs, tape recordings, or videos taken during the speeches. Please turn off any phones, beepers, pages, and watch bars now. There is to be no texting the entire round. Thank you.
It's a predisposed image, hardwired into our brains. So we're not surprised at news of citizens attacked by gunmen in Libya, children being tear gassed by policemen in Kenya, or hundreds of schoolgirls kidnapped in Nigeria. These are typical stories from Africa, what you might even brand as cliché. But where are the open discussions about these current events? Why is it that when killings, kidnappings, or the abusing of children come to light in countries not usually painted in these images, everyone suddenly feels the need to bring justice to the situation? When the exact same cliches are happening in others where these occurrences are considered ordinary. <sighs> Killing, Africa, what else is new? But knowing that these things happen so often does not make them any less significant. In fact, we should be even more concerned. Are we so disillusioned by cliche images of an entire continent that we go so far as to ignore the plight of those living there? It's so ingrained in society that cliches should be ignored to the point that many of us fail to acknowledge things like this. Fearing cliches is one thing, but ignoring them is far worse. We merely look at the surface and neglect the reality such a cliché embodies. We are constantly driving away clichés in a naive manner. We need to change our attitude towards what we consider cliché images, to stop seeing them in a one-sided light. We need to use them to build things up, not bring them down. And I'll tell you how. First, we should all realize that while well, being fresh and innovative is a strong trait, Humans are inherently pattern-seeking creatures. Clichés connect us because they embody enduring things about humanity. There's a reason why writers continue reincarnating the typical hero's journey, or why people still say, love is blind and ignorance is bliss. So, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Secondly, true originality consists not in a new manner, but in a new vision, as novelist Edith Wharton once said. Clichés while this stuff could be simple, can act as figurative pace in the journey towards creativity. Even the most skilled of innovators use cliches to illuminate new ways of thinking. And third, avoiding cliches like the plague is like avoiding yourself. Like us, they are laden with experience, accumulated throughout years, and condensed into a single, all-encompassing entity. We embody a variety of cliches every day. Contrary to Martin and Mrs. book, we should make love, not war with cliches. While it may be hard to teach an old dog new tricks, it shouldn't be that hard reminding any dog of old tricks. So when life gives you lemons, don't be afraid to make lemonade, even if everyone's done it before. The results will be just as sweet. Thank you.
I was in the third grade, my teacher gave my class a pretty unusual exercise when she told everyone to give their table mate a compliment. I stared at the girl sitting across from me, excited, because I just knew her compliment was going to be good. Then she said it. You laugh a lot. <laughs> I was devastated because her compliment was disappointingly bad. My heartbroken third grade self started to seesaw between bouts of why me? And you didn't even mention that I was the first person to memorize my multiplication tables. Reflecting on the intense disappointment I felt back then, sometimes I wonder, why did I not see what that third grade girl said to me as a compliment? Sure, the compliment didn't mention intelligence or my devastatingly good looks, but it did mention laughter. And laughter is indicative of a sense of humor, which should be a good thing, right? Then I realized we as a society don't value humor as much as we think we do or should. During a more recent incident, when my class was asked to choose from a list of a dozen options, the option that we felt made our lives most meaningful, I personally chose having a goal in life, yet others chose looking for love. But nobody chose the option that said having a sense of humor. This showed me that if asked to identify the attribute that we value most, many would sideline humor for things like creativity, intelligence, self-esteem, and I confess myself guilty. See, humor is often associated with negative connotations. Unconsciously, we sometimes think that humor connotes a, a lack of seriousness, a detriment to credibility. It's kind of the reason why the BBC <laughs> website isn't filled with memes saying, you mad broke, in response to the news, or, or why you click backspace on your computer, deleting a joke from your presentation, because people just won't take me seriously. Now, I use the word humor a lot, but I want to say that in referencing humor, I don't mean this ability you have to naturally wake up and be a stand-up comedian. What I mean is that quality you have to not always take yourself so seriously to see the good in a bad situation, to appreciate the irony, the jokes, in the topsy-turvy swirl that is life. Because that, no matter how unfunny you may think you are, is a quality we all could use. What if I told you that humor, well, place humor that is, could very seriously benefit you? Turns out that humor elevates many of the personality traits that we value so dearly. Brain and behavior researcher Karuna Subramaniam found that when given a word association puzzle, volunteers who had just watched a comedy movie performed best at solving the puzzle, as compared to those who had just watched a horror movie, or even worse, sorry physicists, a lecture on quantum mechanics. This study concluded that those exposed to humor were more likely to improve their creativity and problem-solving skills. Why is this the case? What hell? Delving <laughs> into the neurophysiological science behind laughter and humor, brain mapping has shown that the entire brain works together to get a joke. Imagine someone telling you a super corny joke like, why did the scarecrow win in the war? Because he was outstanding in his field. <laughs> Whenever that happens, this is what goes on in your brain. First, the left hemisphere processes the word, the little central emotionality is activated, and 120 milliseconds later, the right hemisphere processes the pattern, the brain gets the joke, happiness is felt as a reward, and then, aha, uh -huh, there's laughter. Basically, as we experience increased brain activity, we also experience increased creativity and problem solving skills. But being the awesome you that you are, why stop there? That's right, I'm talking, bringing out your inner mojo jojo, your inner Dr. Doom. <laughs> because humor is the ever-present infiltrator that steals into our homes and takes over our media and pop culture. 
Simply look at the Nielsen TV ratings, and you will see that four of the five most watched TV series finales in the United States have been comedy series, including iconic classics such as Friends, because who doesn't love watching Joey say, how are you doing? <laughs> or Phoebe singing, smelly cat, smelly cat, what are they feeding you? Because of this commonality, beyond the world of media, humor has its integral place in the world of politics. In the country of Myanmar, long ruled by an authoritarian military junta, comedian Mao Chua was labeled a political prisoner for his comedic puns that could cause negative perceptions for the government's regime. And speaking of puns, late last year, China banned puns from the Chinese language. Yes, you heard right. What may seem like just another The Onion headline, China bans use of all puns from language, is very true. <laughs> the same country that blocked Google and Facebook has now outlawed puns for the sake of promoting accurate use of language, or as many critics suggest, to prevent citizens from suddenly critiquing Chinese leadership and policies. In these situations, forms of humor have been censored because they have evolved into something so much more than just a bad joke. They have evolved into ideas that can influence the entirety of society. With that, it's up to you how much you feel you should value humor. But me? Well, let's just say that if you ever decide to approach me and tell me that I laugh a lot, I'll smile and thank you for the compliment. Thank you.
drop cross-legged on the carpet and enjoy some Scooby-Doo. Since the 1960s, Saturday morning cartoons have been a ritual that have brought parents precious hours of sanity. But on October 4th of last year, Saturday morning cartoons quietly went off air. Without the cartoons, there's no ritual. And don't worry, it's not just our Saturday mornings. Rituals have a vital role to play in our lives. But today they're being lost, either through disuse or misuse. So let's begin by following our nose to find out how loss of rituals impacts ourselves, our families, and our major life events. Finally, we'll kick around some solutions that are kid tested, mother approved. Our loss of rituals impacts not only our Saturday morning breakfasts, but our dinners. The tradition of families gathered around the table, passing dishes and talking about their day, has seen a significant fall in favor. Dr. Marla Eisenberg of the University of Minnesota found that children in families who regularly eat together felt that their parents cared more about them. The journal Obesity also reported the BMI of families who dined together were significantly lower than those who didn't. The loss of this ritual not only drives us apart, but damages our health. In light of our expanding waistlines, many people are turning away from cereal entirely and reaching for quinoa. Since it's high in protein and gluten-free, it's no surprise that foodies and hipsters love it. However, many of quinoa's faithful followers are blissfully unaware of the consequences of consuming this crop. Since the ancient Indians, people in Bolivia have been living off of quinoa as one of the few sources of affordable protein, and it became a staple of their mealtime ritual. Its rise in popularity means most of the crop is being exported, and this once staple food is now too expensive oh. for a majority of Bolivians. According to Simon Romero of the New York Times, Chronic malnutrition in children has increased in quinoa growing areas as a result of inflated prices. And quinoa distributors aren't the only ones cuckoo for commodification. The founders of the Color Run are also profiting from this treatment of Indian culture. The Color Run is a 5K race. At the end, participants celebrate by throwing colored dust. The inspiration? The Hindu festival holy which celebrates the coming of spring and Radha's love for Krishna by throwing colored dust. Barty Taylor, executive director of the Hindu Forum of Europe, said about the color run that someone has seen a marketing opportunity. It has nothing to do with Hinduism. This appropriation is dangerous because it devalues rituals, which provides us with an identity and a means of coping with lack of control. Dr. Scott Shear of the Ohio State University found that those without rites of passage rituals often felt out of control and took to dangerous means like drug abuse or gang involvement to remedy their situations. And rituals are being lost or stolen more often than we notice. The Apache Leap is a sacred land in Arizona where a number of Apache threw themselves to their death rather than be captured and killed by settlements. In December, Congress voted to grant the Apache League to a multi-billion dollar mining conglomerate to dig a mine that would threaten the long-term geological stability of the area. Chairman of the Apache tribe, Terry Rambler, commented, they'll seal us off the rattles, the medicinal plants in the areas, and our prayer areas. Once this land is desecrated, it will infringe on the Apache way of life. And the Apache aren't alone. All across the world, indigenous lands are being taken, which according to the Taliban bombs of the United Nations, threatens their culture, their livelihoods, and their identity as people. Life is full of surprises, and that's why we need to protect our rituals. How can we bring the balance back to our proverbial breakfast? First, we can start small by rediscovering <coughs> rituals in our own cultures, online genealogy companies, or even calling a grandparent can be enough to 
uncover lost bridges. Second, we must be careful not to take part in what NPR reporter Brenda Salinas calls Columbusing, when people discover something that really existed for centuries, just not in our own culture. This leads to appropriating rituals without adopting the meaning behind them. When we experience something important to another culture, we must ask ourselves whether we are authentically benefiting from it or divorcing the ritual from the culture as a whole. Lastly, we must ensure the rituals we do have don't fade away. One way we can do this is to look back to our roots. Journalist Patrick Bowler tells the story of Yaakov Wong, a descendant of the Jewish community in Kaifang, China. When Yaakov was young, his father told him about the wonders of his ancestry, dating back to the Song dynasty. Yaakov explored his Jewish heritage, learned Hebrew, and will soon become the first Chinese rabbi in 200 years. We can all learn from Yaakov's experience by bringing back rituals, not just for ourselves, but for our communities. So, although we may have lost Saturday morning cartoons, it's not too late to save our other rituals. After all, as novelist Henry James wrote, it takes an endless amount of history to make even a little tradition. And recognizing that might help us preserve the snap, crackle, and pop that makes our lives truly meaningful. Thank you. Neil Armstrong 
land on the moon for the first time. 1972, a nine-year-old girl runs on a crash chute in Vietnam, naked, her clothes burned from an napalm attack. 1989, a man stands in front of four tanks the morning after the Chinese military stops Tiananmen Square protests. 2001, Steve Jobs proudly holds up the first iPod for the world to see. These iconic photos have illustrated a few of modern history's turning points. One of these pictures had Martin Luther King sharing his dream with the world, or Marilyn Monroe laughing as the wind blows up her jets in a New York City subway grate. The one common denominator is that they capture movements. Not only do the pictures themselves represent the progress that mankind has made in the past century, but the fact that they were taken at all shows us what people value at a certain time and place. The goal of every photographer is to try to freeze moments, but that relationship changes once that three-way exchange disappears and all that's left is the camera in you. We live in a time where the millennials, more commonly referred to as the me generation, are becoming the ones in charge. As the me generation, we are characterized as people valuing self-fulfillment and realization over traditional social responsibilities. Yet, there is great beauty in this new culture, namely that now, instead of relying on other people to make things known, we are standing up and doing it for ourselves. In the past, we needed a million march to get recognition, a civil war to legally abolish American slavery, the salt march in India to oppose the rule, or the French Revolution to voice the cries of the oppressed. Thousands of whispers were needed to create a scream. But now, we have the power to make things that hide in the dark come into light with the click of a button. In 2013, a video was released called One Photo a Day, in the worst year of my life. It starts off with a woman looking healthy and vibrant. Each day, she takes a picture of her face, and we see her smile progress into an almost unrecognizable one, full of bruises. She ends with a sign that says, help me, I don't know if I will be here tomorrow. This woman was able to save herself by making her secret domestic abuse a public cry for help even though she may not have had direct contact with the outside world, she used what was readily available to her and what is readily available to all of us, the camera and social media. It is this power of the individual that makes the 21st century so special. The concept of the selfie is one that marks our generation's social footprint. Karl Marx said, it is not the consciousness of men that determines their being, but on the contrary, their social being that determines their consciousness. In other words, selfies originate from the world in which we live. And the world that we live in is one that is full of blank canvases waiting to be painted with self-portraits, where everyone has the right to their own face, their own story. But perhaps, even subconsciously, we already know that. When we take a picture, we show the sides of us that we want others to see, which could be the happy or attractive parts of our lives but it can also be what we need people to know. The fact that we are in charge of what we share with others is game-changing. The selfie is a platform that unites people and that it is a medium for self-expression. But the true magic lies in the stories that it tells, how those stories connect people, and how they remind us what it means to be human. This past summer, 15-year-old Gary Salk took a selfie with his mother as they settled in after boarding their flight from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. In the picture, both Gary and his mother look excited for their family holiday, not knowing that in just a few hours, their aircraft, the MH17, will crash, killing all 283 passengers and 15 crew on board. Through his last picture, Gary was able to keep his story alive, with news reporters being able to put a face to the tragedy Gary was a symbol for those who died on that flight. Those who loved Gary were able to share their memories of him and carry on his legacy. And for those who heard of his story, the people on the MH17 were just that, people. 
not statistics. When someone takes a selfie, they tell their own story, whether it relates to things that are already publicized or things that should be. Victims of mental illness, religious bigotry, racial profiling, domestic violence, sexual assault, and slut shaming are now embraced by the interactive world and increasingly in communities around us. Because now, we have the opportunity to reveal sides of us that used to be hidden. With almost everyone taking selfies, we create a social movement, one that is both personal and revolutionary in nature. Coming out videos, online suicide forums, political podcasts, they're all conversations that have existed since the, since the birth of the modern man. Except now, you can reach the entire world with a simple click. We live in a world that has breached the wall separating us as individuals from other people. No longer does distance, language, money, or numbers stop us from getting our messages across. There's only one you in the world. The unique combination of your experiences are entirely your own. The power that the selfie provides is that we can now share those individual experiences. So why not make your story a catalyst for change in another side? You are the author, the painter, the speaker, the photographer. You have the power to say whatever you need to say. And no matter what that is, someone is going to listen. You have the tool to craft your own message. What are you going to make with it? Thank you.
That is just my nickname. <laughs> this year, I was in New Kid High School. And as soon as I introduced myself and told them my long name, I was bombarded with hundreds of questions, such as, how many goods do you wear? Why don't you eat meat? Can you fix my phone? <laughs> I told to my father, and I told him about my first day. He chuckled and said, it's okay. Those are just misconceptions. So just the other day, obviously while dancing with my pet cobra, I thought to myself, what are misconceptions? How are they created? What is their impact on society and us? And what can we do to stop these misconceptions? I first, first gave a press of, what are misconceptions? To get the best answer, I went up to the most trusted and credible source of information in the world that is used by high school students all over, Yahoo Answers, <laughs> which stated that a misconception is a belief, view, or opinion that is usually widely held and that is incorrect. Now I thought to myself, how are misconceptions created? The first reason is stereotypes. Now, when I first say stereotypes, Statements such as Africans being better runners, Irish drinking Guinness for breakfast, or Asians having higher IQs come into your mind. The truth is, stereotypes don't really comprise of faulty ideas of race and ethnicity. They're about something far deeper. Stereotypes are about status. A recent study conducted through almost a thousand surveys by psychologists Susan Fiske and Amy Cuddy of the Princeton University show that the so-called high-status competitive groups were characterized by a stereotype of high competence, while the so-called low-status non-competitive groups were characterized by a stereotype of low competence. Yes, in today's day and age, people are being judged not by their ideas or their opinions. They're being judged by their socioeconomic status. We can't let ourselves and others be influenced by these idiots. Ah, idiots. That brings me to my next point, the media. Misconceptions <laughs> are generated and spread due to the reinforcement of the media. I mean, don't get me wrong. The media is a great thing. It helps us spread news around the world. It keeps us up to date with current events, but if put in the wrong hands, it can create disaster. Let me give you an example. I want all of you sitting here to close your eyes, think, and imagine everything that comes into your mind when I say the following. Iraq. Now open your eyes. I'm sure that in the past few seconds, most of you imagined guns, bombs, terrorists, hostages, or the painful sight that is of seeing a child cry. But I want to ask you, how many of you imagined the world-famous Haq, the beautiful, well-preserved site in Iraq that is officially a UNESCO World Heritage Site? Or imagine the marvel that is the Lake Dokan near the city of Rani. Why didn't you? Because the media has filled images into your mind that causes you to make these misconceptions. They have made you believe what they want you to believe. Most of these media organizations are controlled by the so-called upper crust of society. The wealthy, the famous, the elite. This brings me to the third reason for misconceptions, the influence of the rich and the powerful. Let me give you an example. How many of you sitting in this room have heard of a man named Mulayam Singh Yadav? As expected, to those of you who don't know, Mr. Yadav is the ex-chief minister of one of the largest and most populated states in India. And when asked about his views on rape, Mr. Yadav replied, Boys will be boys. They make mistakes. This man 
is one of the most prominent politicians in the largest democracy in the entire world. He creates the misconception that rape is a mistake and that it doesn't deserve a punishment. People get influenced by his opinion and may just inculcate it into their lives and make them their beliefs. And if this happens, I am shocked to think what lies in the future for mankind. That is the problem with the human mind. It judges without understanding. It absorbs without knowing what's absorbing. It learns things that need not be learned. These misconceptions impair the ability of judgment. They hurt certain groups, but most importantly, they divide people. We need to put an end to them. And though it will be an uphill battle, it's a battle that can be won through a couple of solutions that I will present through a slightly unorthodox manner. Be informed, understand how these stereotypes are made, and maybe the misconceptions may start to fade, but the media is reinforcing them. What do we do? I'm going to keep quiet while I answer from you. Why don't you put the TV off, turn down those dials, spread some awareness, happiness, smiles. What about everything our leaders say? Just take all the negativity and keep it at bay. Listen to one ear. Take out what is right. We can change the world, people, with our might. All these misconceptions can go out of sight if we as boys and girls truly unite. Didn't think I could rap right? That's the deception you just gave in to the misconception, my vision. <laughs> is not an illusion of less division and more inclusion. Brotherhood together and this unity and improve and unparalleled society. Did you get the message? Did you enjoy this rap? If the answer is yes, can I hear it? Clap. Eighteen delegates are gathered here today from six different schools battling it out for OO glory. I bet that every single one of us was told to think of a topic, find a metaphor that works, and to not forget that all important book. 
But how many of us sat down and wondered, why don't I spice things up for a change? Three decades ago, in the space of only 18 months, Apple Incorporated revolutionized technology with the invention of the Macintosh and the laser writer under the banner of Think Different. Since then, we've been passed the torch, given the mantle to think different and change the world yet. I worry that most of us haven't even tried. We've become so enticed by fancy names like Harvard, Yale, or Oxford that we've allowed ourselves to become yet another heat of the educational rat race. We claim to be learning at school, but really, we're just selecting courses and joining clubs that are not the objects of our passions, but the ones that will boost our chances of enrolling in the Ivy Leagues. Everything we do has become devoted to ensuring that we receive that coveted acceptance letter in the mail. I understand that when we join those CV boosting clubs or those GPA boosting courses, we feel the comfort of a more fail-safe academic future. I understand that it's not easy to take risks. We fear becoming the artist who can't afford paint, or the musician that ends up a street busker. I understand because I live with this fear every single day. Since childhood, I've loved films. I love the diversity of genres, whether it be the over-the-top action movies like The Fast and the Furious, or touching films like Schindler's List that pull at the heartstrings. I love the visionary directors and the cinematographers who push the boundaries of editing, mixing, and visual effects. I visit IMDb on a daily basis. I put off homework assignments just to watch movie reviews on YouTube. In a recent English class, I even did an excellent job of pretending to read the picture of Dorian Gray, when really, I was just following the Oscars live on Twitter. <laughs> Nevertheless, I failed to believe that I could become the next Steven Spielberg or the next Martin Scorsese. I failed to think different. <coughs> and what do I do instead? I pass on the chance to attend the New York Film Academy summer camp in exchange for a mountain of SAT prep books by Kaplan and Colin Ford. I made my course selections look exactly like that of any other Korean male STEM student filled with the usual suspects, biology, chemistry, statistics, and the devil himself, physics. <laughs> Every physics class, as far as I can recall, is exactly the same. When I walk into the classroom, I disregard the lesson on the board, and I flip open my computer. On the screen are the tabs I opened last night, list after list of college rankings and admissions details. As doctor teacher's lesson begins, I enter my slumber. I need my beauty sleep because I spent the last night marathoning the Godfather trilogy, despite the third one being terrible. And as I dream, I see myself planting my palms on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. But I awake to Dr. Teacher's declaration. Don't forget, there's a test on gravity next class. And I want to cry. Not because of this assessment, not because I don't value gravity, but because I would rather be watching Gravity. <laughs> I want to be in a cinema enjoying the ultimate movie experience on IMAX. Instead, because I have to sit at home studying, the best I can do is load up an iTunes file on my 12-inch Mac Pro screen, deprived of the cinematic awe because I chose the traditional academic path. My decision my failure to think different left me in a position where I've robbed myself of my passions. And this is a position where students constantly find themselves. All signs actually seem to recommend that we should think different. MIT's online app tells us to choose our activities because they really delight, intrigue, and challenge us, not because we think they look impressive on our application. UPenn says that it could easily fill its class with valedictorians or students with perfect test scores, but their goal is to build the ideal incubator for tomorrow's leaders. <coughs> Google's hiring program has shifted focus from GPAs and now conducts interviews via brain teasers because they are looking for problem solvers, not sheep. Even my own subconscious is telling me that instead of suffering in Physics 101, I should be taking intro to film studies, 
learning about how shots and angles influence mood and tone. But I'm not. I'm stuck in a rut, following the pattern. I live my life adhering to norms, neglecting my passions in the hopes of an early decision. Even as I stand here giving this speech, even as I grapple in front of you to think different, I am bathing in my own pool of hypocrisy. I started with a hook. I referenced pop culture. And I tossed in my own personal anecdote. And why? Because I am afraid of a poor ranking. Because I am afraid to think different. Lots of things out there scare us. We hear rumors that the IVs have seen record high applications or record low acceptance rates. But at the end of the day, the evidence is clear. The colleges we love to worship and impress want us to think different, to prepare us for the future, which will focus not on our GPAs, but on the skills we possess. So why can't we think different? I wish I could tell you. Despite the bombardment of signals that tell me otherwise, I can't seem to break away from what has worked so well in the past. I can't seem to think different. What I do know is that I don't wish to live in this world where a Google search of GPA calculator returns a million and a half hits. I don't wish to live in this world where next generation students will also mindlessly study just to get the letter A slapped on their transcripts. I may not know how to think different. Here's how I will give it a shot. Course selections just began at my school last week, and this time, I didn't sign up for advanced physics. I signed up for intro to film studies instead. You can tell me it's too late, but I am doing it anyway. So tell me, what will your first step be?
know what you're thinking. Where is she from? Well, so far I've gotten Russian, Portuguese, Indian, African, Persian, and Pakistani. But I have a better description of where I'm from. My family is that family that walks into the airport and the security people go, ooh. <laughs> but then we show them our American passports and they say, oh, America, Obama, come, come. <laughs> As you can imagine, airports are a tricky place for my family. We've even been asked to refrain from speaking our native language as it may seem like a threat to some people. They've even incorporated more random full body scans during security checks. I told my dad, you must be a really lucky man. You always get to have full body scans. <laughs> my dad just sighs and says, they're just doing their job. In the UK, those from ethnic minorities are up to 42 times more likely than Caucasians to be stopped during a security check. As an ethnic minority, I find these numbers startling. Muslims in particular are often the focus of these random searches. For as long as I can remember, my parents taught me that Islam is, is a religion of peace and tolerance. When we greet each other, we don't say, hey, we say assalamu alaikum. Its literal translation is peace be with you. Growing up, it was astonishing to see how negatively the media was portraying Muslims. When I was in Australia recently, I witnessed firsthand the media's distortion of Islam. I was watching the news with my family. Suddenly, there was a breaking news report about a shooting in Ottawa. Someone had run into Parliament Hill and opened fire. The reporter said three things about this shooter. He's male, he's in his early 30s, and he converted to Islam two years ago. I remember thinking, why was his religion relevant? As we continued watching the news, there was another story about a boy in Washington who had brought a gun to his school and started shooting. Never once was his religion mentioned. No one said, this boy was born and raised a Christian. The media only stated that he was in a very emotional state that day. No one knows why he did it. But what I know for certain is that no one judged his entire religion based on only his actions. In 2007, a study in the UK found that 91% of articles in national newspapers about Muslims were negative. Why is the media trying to make Muslims seem like the antagonists? As if all 1.6 billion of us are to blame. Instead of reporting on the majority of the population that is condemning ISIS, the media focuses on ISIS itself. They'd rather report on the minority than listen to the majority. Imagine a world where the media portrayed Christianity as it portrays Islam. You would hear about the 20 million people that the US has killed since World War II. You would read about the lynchings in the late 1900s of almost 4,000 African Americans that were religious rituals done in the name of Christianity. Still, it is Islam and not Christianity that the media portrays as a violent religion. And it's not just the media. Politicians take part in creating this false image of Muslims. President Obama, who also happens to be an ethnic minority, is often criticized by his Republican opponents. However, when they really want to slander him, they don't call him a godless atheist. They call him a Muslim, as if it is the worst insult they could give him. As humans, we take almost a sadistic pleasure in having enemies. We have always needed a group to despise. We also have an innate fear of what we do not understand. Jews, Native Americans, homosexuals, women, African Americans have all faced hostility in one way or another. If 
took half a million people to die in the Civil War for Americans to realize that blacks were people, not property. Women in America weren't given the right to vote until 1920. It took the U.S. 144 years to realize that women were equal to men. I don't want to wait 144 years to see change. I don't want to hear about half a million people that had to die in order for a lesson to be learned. I don't want to walk into airports and have people look at my family like we've done something wrong just by being there. I don't want to clarify that I'm not a terrorist every time I mention my religion. We cannot continue to allow this intolerance. By carrying these prejudices, we are only limiting our own humanity. We must restore the media back to its original purpose. Spreading news, not prejudices. When we see articles filled with bigotry and discrimination, we need to voice our opinions. When we see people falling victim to hate crimes, we cannot sit back and watch their families suffer. We need to demand justice. As the poet Jalal Abdin Muhammad Rumi once said, Christian, Jew, Muslim, stone, mountain, river, each has a secret way of being with the mystery. Each is unique and not to be judged. Now, I know what you're thinking. She still hasn't told us where she's from. Whether I am Indian or Pakistani or Persian, it should make no difference as to how I am treated. Remember, when we use a broad brush to paint others, we splatter ourselves with ignorance. I don't want to live in a world filled with ignorance anymore. The question is, do you? Thank you for a wonderful day of speaking.